The Lord bless you, brethren beloved. Welcome to another night of Bible study. And uh, we give God thanks for all of us who are able to join in to go through from the Word of God. Uh, tonight we are going to be going into something that is most important in our walk with God. Of course, everything that we teach is important, but there are some things that strike a chord. There are some things when we look at it and dissect it, we realize how crucial it is to our walk as children of God. And it is one thing for us to be walking and to do our best to focus. It's another thing when we start to recognize and realize exactly what we are up against that you know it somehow gives us a jolt and wake us up to the reality of what we are in and sometimes we do need that jolt it's not anything that is going to frighten us but at the same time it is something that should cause us to ponder and to think a little bit deeper because i know that all of us want to make it into the kingdom of God. All of us want to, when that trumpet sounds, we all want to make it. And there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that every child of God, wherever we are on the measuring stick in terms of where we are in our walk with God, I do believe with my whole heart that we all want to make it. And so it is important that we take into consideration these simple things that we are presenting, yet profound and deep things, so that we can adjust ourselves and make our calling and election sure. I want to talk to us and to go into a simple study of this thing that is called temptation. And so for our study, tonight, possibly it might go over into next week, but we'll try to wrap it up this evening. Strategies for defeating temptation. You see, many of us, we, when we examine ourselves and when we, you know, talk to our fellow brethren, we realize you will hear the discussions over and over. You know, I, I just didn't make it as I wanted to make it through the day today or yesterday or last week. You know, I was tempted and I succumbed. I yielded to one particular temptation or the other. And for many saints, we treat with temptation as if it is something that uh, I, 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 I yielded today, but I'm going to just, you know, tomorrow, and then the same thing happens tomorrow, and then the same thing happens the other day, and it just becomes a part of life. But I want us, brethren, to understand that when we are talking about temptation, it is not something to be taken lightly. It is not something to trifle with. It is not something to just keep up as a part of or everyday walk temptations will come and they will come every day and they will come with force and with venom but i want us to understand that it is not something that any child of god should trifle with we must see it for what it is it is a, 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 a it is an offense it is something that is like the adversary declaring war against the saints of Almighty God, the saints of God. Temptations are presented to us with a view by Satan to trip us, to cause us to fumble and to stumble and to fall. And then when he, we fall, he stretches out to hammer us down to finish us of. Brethren, beloved, it is important that we know that temptations will come. Temptation is going to be at our doors in the morning. It is going to be at our workplaces and schools during the course of the day. And it is important that we recognize that temptation must come. I want to state at the very outset that temptation by its, itself 
is not a sin. Yes, we all will be tempted. We all will have things that are going to be injected in our minds. We all will realize that there are things that are going to come in front of our eyes so that they are there to cause us to shift our focus from serving God and to shift our focus from doing the things that are right and to focus on something else that Satan literally puts in our way. He knows that if we are focused on the word, he knows that if we are focused on doing right and living right, we are going to be going through, uh, yes, step by step, moment by moment, we are going to be going through. He knows that. So he has declared war, and a part of what he does as a normal course of action is to tempt us and to tempt us in ways that he knows, because make no mistake about it, God knows our weaknesses, but I want us to understand that the adversaries, Satan and the minions that are with him, they also know our weaknesses. They know when we under the quiet tune in to a particular television show, a particular movie. The, he knows when we go into dark corners and do things that because the light is dim and nobody is seeing. He knows what we are doing and what we are engaging in. He knows the books that we read and we hide and we cover it in the gleaner and all those other things. He knows the places where we go at 10 and 11 o'clock in the night when we should be at home in our beds and at home praying or doing something. He knows the corners that we are at certain times in the day or certain times in the night. He knows. So he knows our frailties. He knows our weaknesses. And let me tell us, beloved, Satan now moves with temptation to push against what he knows are our weaknesses. And it is important that we understand that if we are going to walk as children of God and if we are going to make it in as children of God, it is important that we know that we have to overcome temptation. Yet so many of God's people have fallen and yielded and given into temptations. And I want us to understand how terrible that is i want us to understand what is at work what is at play one when we are tempted but two more importantly when we yield to temptation it is not something that is right yes we will yield from time to time and we are going to drill in and go into it but we must understand what we are up against our souls are at risk our lives are at risk when we yield constantly 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 to temptations now there are those that are saved and we have been saved for a long time and we are struggling with some things and i know that we all struggle but even as we struggle it is important to understand that we have with every temptation a way of escape and so many of us are unable for one reason or the other to find that particular avenue, to find that particular road, to find that particular way of escape so that we can preserve under God, preserve our souls. We constantly succumb and we constantly fall and we constantly falter and it happens today and we kind of rise up tomorrow today again and it happens tomorrow and by tomorrow we rise up again but we are not somehow living the overcoming life the the more abundant life that we know and read about somehow somewhere we have allowed temptations not only to come but we have allowed ourselves to yield to temptation to the point where we are losers we are no longer victors but we are victims and so i'm here tonight to expose temptation for what it is if we do not push against and fight against and at all costs try to evade and escape i am submitting to us that temptations they will grab us and squeeze
squeeze us to death, like how a snake squeezes his that animal or person. It will sting and then squeeze to death. And we better understand that it is a fact in scripture. The Bible tells us about Cain and Abel. And we know the story where Cain decided that he was going to kill his brother Abel. Something happened and it happened in his mind and he dwelt on that thing and God had to say to him, be careful Cain, sin lieth at the door. Sin is waiting at the door. Beloved, if we are unable to, if we do not see temptation for what it is, remember it is going to grab us it is lying at the door and waiting for the right moment to pounce on us and to grab us and to squeeze the life out of us so the warning was given to Cain look if you do what is right all is well if you continue in the way that you're going remember sin lie it at the door it is waiting why is it waiting why is it lying there it is waiting to pounce that temptation that is there to harm and to hurt his brother because his brother seemed to be advancing and progressing and growing and god seemed to somehow accept Abel and reject cain and it caused something inside of him to become bitter and envious and temptation now faced him and the warning came listen to me you have allowed this to enter into your mind you have allowed this to enter into your heart be careful sin lieth at the door and when we allow temptation to, uh, to lay at our door it is just a matter of time in the same way how Cain waited for the right time to come because he allowed the thing to remain at the door. We better be careful when temptation comes our way. Move away. Don't harbor it in our minds. Don't harbor these temptations in our heart. That is why, that is at the root of why so many of God's people have faltered, have fallen. They are no longer in the church and some are in the church in the building but they are not really here they have fallen temptations that have come in like a flood have overwhelmed them to the extent that they are around but they are not here their bodies are here but their minds their hearts is in another place it is serving another god because they have allowed temptation to overpower them and it is important that we understand that we must at all costs no matter what deal with temptation sin is deadly temptation when it comes is battering us so that we yield and once we yield it becomes sin and sin is deadly and it is out for you and satan is out to get you he's out to get me he's out to get us that call on the name of the lord and it is important that we never ever forget that and so when we talk about strategies to defeat temptation we're coming with something practical because all of us face temptation on a daily basis how we deal with it however is what is going to make the difference between the overcoming christian and the christians the ones that become victims and so we need to be very mindful of that it was temptation that in the very beginning of time from the book of genesis notice what happened the dilemma that we are in today came about as a result of satan tempting Adam and Eve. Well, the temptation started with Eve. And this is how he always works. And he comes with temptations and he tempts us in the areas where he knows we are weak. And this is how we yield and we fall. And so we are going to take some time today to expose temptation and expose it for what it is so that we understand that it is not something to play around with but it is something that we must 
push aside at all costs our lives, our walk with God literally depend on how we deal with this thing called temptation. Now, I'm going to make a point from a particular scripture coming from the book of First Kings, and we don't have to turn to it, but it's First Kings chapter 13 because it outlines a scenario, and I want us to understand the, the principle, the concept of temptation and ultimately disobedience when we yield to temptation. The Bible outlines a narrative where we know what happened after David had passed the leadership on to his son uh, Solomon. And we know Solomon, what he did and how he walked away from the precepts of Almighty God. And God allowed the kingdom to be removed from Solomon, from King Solomon. And it was after it was given to his son Rehoboam, later on, the kingdom was split in two. Now, the king of Israel was now Jeroboam. And of course, we know the two tribes that stayed, Judah, Benjamin, and it was ruled by Rehoboam. But Jeroboam was now the king that ruled the ten nations, the ten tribes, the other ten tribes, you know, which was called Israel. And what was happening, God allowed the division of the kingdom. He allowed the kingdom of Israel to be divided as judgment based on the wicked things that were happening in the land. And his judgment was the division, the, the tearing asunder of the nation of Israel. It was one under King David. It was one under King Solomon. And later on, because of the wickedness and because they had turned away from God and everything, the kingdom was divided into two. You had the northern and you had the southern kingdoms. But there was a particular thing that was now happening in Israel that I want us to consider. Jeroboam was now turning the people of Israel. He had now stopped them from going down to Jerusalem to serve and to worship God. It was the custom once every year that everybody would go down to Jerusalem to worship the Lord, you know, at particular times. And Jeroboam, in his attempt to you know, consolidate the kingdom under him, he now started to redirect people not to go to Jerusalem, but to go to a different place, to go to Bethel. Now, we will remember that Bethel was that place where Jacob had his relationship with Almighty God. It was the place, it was actually called the house of God. It was that place where Jacob, when he put his head on that pillar and on his way to a particular place, God came down and visited him. It was that place of visitation, the house of God. It had spiritual significance. And it was at that very same place that Jeroboam was now turning the people away from God and had erected some golden statues, a golden calf, and caused the people to come to Bethel, the place where God revealed himself to Jacob and established that he was the God of the house of God. He was, this was the house of God and he was the God of the house of God. This same place Jeroboam had now set up idols and was worshiping God and was directing and diverting the people from going to the true place of worship and to stay right there at Bethel and worship false gods. It reached the point where God could not deal with it anymore. And he was now going to pronounce judgment upon Jeroboam and judgment upon Israel. Yes. And while they were there doing all that they were doing and continuing in that particular line along that particular path, the Bible said that God raised up a prophet out of Judah and sent him on a mission into Israel to go down to that particular place and to 
prophesied to the king, to Jeroboam, and to let him know what God was going to unleash upon the land and upon him because of what they were doing, diverting and redirecting the people from serving the true and living God and to start to worship idols. And God sent for a prophet. Now, the Bible did not give us the name of this prophet. In 1 Kings chapter 13, we, we see this story unfolding. We see this narrative unfolding where God said, listen to me now. I want you to go down there and I want you to prophesy these words to that king and to the people that are there. I want you to neither venture to the left nor to the right. And when you are true with your prophecy and declaring my word, I want you to turn back and I want you to head right back to where you're coming from. Don't stop, stop with anybody. Don't eat at anybody's house. Don't receive anything from the hands of any one of those people, lest it appear that you are condoning with their wrongs. That no doubt that was the reason why God gave him the instruction. And so this prophet, he had no name. In, I want us to understand that God don't have to use somebody that we are familiar with. God has his people that he can use. And here it is that this prophet came down and with authority and power declared the prophetic word of Almighty God in that place. And while he was there doing what he was doing and declaring the word, the king tried to stop him and came over to rough up the man of God and threaten him. And God took note of the threat. Understand, follow where I'm going. God took note of the threat. And when he lifted his hand as if he was going to put it out and whether he was going to smite or whatever he was going to do to the prophet, the servant of the Lord, God smote the king and his hand withered. And would you believe the prophet carried out the instructions of the Lord. The prophet declared the prophetic word of the Lord without fear to the king and wherever else he prophesied. And he did what the Lord commanded him to do. And in fact, although God smote that king with a withered hand because of his presumptuousness to try to hit the man of God, God took note and God protected the servant of God. So that servant did and carried out the specific instructions of God. He asked the servant to pray for him that his hand would be, you know, renewed, be restored. And he prayed and God, God heard the prayer of the servant. And the king's hand was restored. Brethren, beloved, he now decided to go back where he came from. And when on his way, the king says, come, please stop by, man, and have something with me. Eat something with me. Indeed, you are a man of God. And you, with boldness, declare the word of God. And the man of God said, no, 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 thank you. Thank you, but no thanks. Thanks, but no thanks. And he carried on along his way. And after they tried to stop him and say, all right, come do, have a drink, man. Have a little food. Take a little rest. The man remembered this was temptation now because the king was, this is the mighty king. And the king was saying, stop man, drink something, eat something, refresh yourself. I am the king. The man remembered the word of the Lord. And even though it was tempting, because no doubt he would have been thirsty. No doubt he would have been tired coming from so far. No doubt the place would have been hot and dusty. He could have done with some refreshments and refreshed himself. But the word said, don't stop left nor right. Don't drink or eat from any man. Do the will, the will and the work of the Lord. Pronounce the prophetic word and go right back to where you came from. That was the word of the Lord. And so the man, that prophet, did not stop, did not budge. The temptation was there. And he did not yield. And he left and he was on his way back to the place where he was coming from. However, while he was on his way home, another prophet 
came on the scene because he heard of all that had happened and he came on the scene and beloved when he came on the scene he presented himself to this prophet who just did the work of the Lord and said I too am a prophet of God and last night an angel of the Lord appeared to me and told me to invite you to turn into my house and to eat with me and again temptation every step of the way I want us to understand brethren beloved temptation will present itself this is how Satan works this is how things happen and so the king said come and the man knew that he should not go and he did not go it didn't matter that it was the king that had all but guess what now a man turned up and said he too is a prophet of the Lord and the prophet said an angel spoke to me and said to tell you to turn off and you know what that prophet did who knew the word of the Lord who followed through with the word of the Lord up to this point no this thing came to him again still temptation an evil angel an evil man that presented himself as an angel of light turned up and said turn off because the Lord sent an angel and said you must come stay with me and the man of God the prophet that was faithful with the word and was faithful and avoided the temptation that came with the king now heard another man say God said to tell you and he turned aside and you know what happened the anger of the Lord was kindled. The man yielded to the temptation. He knew that he shouldn't stop. It was the clear, unequivocal word of Almighty God. And he turned off and yielded to the temptation. And you know what God did? When that man was finished, and he was now leaving, having refreshed himself at the house of this other prophet, that said an angel visited him and tell him to do this and to do that. And that was not the case. Or if it was, it was an angel of darkness. He allowed himself to be tricked, to be tempted, and to yield to the temptation. The Bible said when he was on his way, God sent a, a ferocious lion that met him on the way. And it was not by chance. Some theologians say by chance he happened to be walking and the lion came. And it was not by chance. God sent the lion and that lion pounced on him and slew him there and then the lion did not go attack the donkey that he was riding on and eat the donkey which you know any hungry lion would do and the lion just killed the man and stood beside him it was clear that it was the judgment of the Lord why because the man yielded to the temptation he knew what was right he knew what he was supposed to do he knew what he was not supposed to do he started out Yes, he started out. Let me tell you what we learned. We learned so much from this. We have to be careful, beloved. And I'm coming to the slides because I want to go through some things with us. But I want to make it clear to us that temptation is not something that we must play around with and trifle with. Our lives depend on it. And ultimately, our souls depend on it. The Bible said that that servant of God did not. God said that not even you're gonna, not going to be buried in the place where your fathers are buried. He was buried in a strange place. He was buried in Bethany. He did not go over to Judah. Not go over to the place where he was from and where his ancestors were all buried. He did not get that privileged. He was buried in somewhere strange understand that the man knew and he recognized temptation and he was already based on what happened the first time he already dealt with that temptation because he knew the word of God and when he met this other prophet he still knew the word of God but he allowed himself to be lowered because he somehow had missed at some point 
And this is the lesson, you know, it doesn't matter how strong we are and how strong we were yesterday. At a particular point, we must be careful and be aware that temptation is such that at our weakest moment, and this is how Satan works with, somehow we don't seem to understand. He looks for the weak moments. He looks for the tired moments. He looks for the weary moments. He looks for the person who just wants to lo love spiritism and say just you just want to hear say a man say I have a word for you and you just want to hear a man say I have a message for you you don't even know the person you don't know where they are from you don't know nothing about them but they come with a word from heaven and I can tell you this and I can tell you what's going to happen tomorrow and all those kind of things and I can see deep into this and we are moved so easily at that and the man was moved away from the clear caught word of God that he knew and went aside with him and the man was a false prophet maybe God might have used him before to do something but at this moment he was false and the word that he gave to this prophet that an angel visited him was false or it was an angel of darkness and the man succumbed to it I am submitting to us, beloved. We better be careful. Walk day by day. Be aware of our surroundings as Christians. Be aware of the things that are pushed at us and that, that comes to our mind and our heart. Be aware and be careful of the things that we entertain. Be aware and be careful of the things that we embrace. They are temptations and they are coming from the devil and they are coming fast and furious and they are set to trip us up. And that man died, the lion tore him to pieces. Now, this is the other point that I want to make. You see, obeying halfway, we can be obedient halfway because the man obeyed and delivered the word. The man obeyed and prophesied the word. That was obedience. Then when the, when the king said, come stay with me, the man said, no, no, no. The word of the Lord said, don't do that. And he left. So he was obedient with the word. He was obedient with moving away from the king's place and continued on his way home. But when he reached to the other prophet, he disobeyed. Half truth, half obedience is disobedience. So we can't tap ourselves and say, I did this and I did that and I did that. But I was uh, tempted and I yielded to the temptation. And so I get three quarters of the mark and the other mark. Half of a halfway obedience is full disobedience. We are either going to be obedient right through or we are going to be disobedient. If we are disobedient in part, we are effectively disobedient in all. And this is what came out of this little scripture in 1 Kings chapter 13. We need to understand the depth of what temptation is and what it does to us. It kills us. It robs our ministry. It robs us of victory. And we will pay the ultimate price if we underestimate what temptation does to us and how it fights against us and how it will rob and ultimately kill us. Understand this thing is not something to be trifled with. Deal with temptation. Deal with it as a, as a child of God. And we are going to drill into something. So having said that, we are going to go to the presentation and I'm going to go through some things with it. I want us to establish in our minds that temptation is real and I don't have to tell us that because we know it is we, we experience temptations every day but there are some things I want us to realize and recognize and I want us to see and to know the power of temptations when we yield to it. The power of temptation even if we don't yield to it at which point it is not sin. But because of how powerful it is and, and how fast and furious the devil throws things at us to tempt us, we must be aware and we must be careful. Hence, strategies to defeat, strategies to overcome temptations. If we have this, we have it locked. And 
by the help of God and with the power of the Spirit of God, all of us can overcome. All of us can deal with temptation. We don't have to be like this prophet in 1 Kings that the Bible did not name. But the thing is written. And the fact that God gave this scripture space in the canon, space in the book, is significant. Clearly, there is a message there that the Lord wants us to get. And I want us to get that, to understand that we don't play around with temptation. We don't play around with anything like this that is associated with, associated with the devil. He's out to get you. He's out to get me. He's out to get us. Do not play with temptation. Build a guard around you. Be aware of your surroundings. All of us. And push to live for God. So I'm going to just expand on temptation a little bit more now. And then let us understand some more. And understand how Satan tempts us. And when we understand that we are more prepared to deal with it. So that ours can be an overcoming and powerful Christian walk. Very, very important. Let's look to the um, presentation. Let's turn to the first slide at this time so that we can um, go through and appreciate, yes, some more critical things about uh, temptation, what it is all about, how this thing manifests itself, how this thing works in our lives. It is so important, yes, that we um, understand. Now, James chapter 1, verses 12 and 13 tells us some things about temptation. I want us to just read this scripture first, and then we start to kind of dissect and go down. It is very important that we uh, appreciate James chapter 1, Verse 12, blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. I, I stop there. I want us to understand, beloved. I want us to be clear in our minds that temptation is something that the devil literally throws at us. God allows it, but it is really the adversary. It is really Satan that tempts us. And he does that simply because he wants to trip us up and he knows that once we yield to temptation, we are in the realm of disobedience. And that was exactly what caused the downfall of man from going back into the book of Genesis. The disobedience, they disobeyed the word of God, they disobeyed the thing that God told them not to do, and they did the total opposite. Temptation, if we yield, it ends in disobedience. And that is something that the devil knows, and that is the reason why he pushes and he tempts us. But there is something I want us to know. Temptation by and of itself is not a sin. And it is important that we, we understand and we grasp that point. The consequence of disobedience is going to be terrible but temptation by itself is not sin when we yield to temptation when we disobey then that pushes and goes on to sin and that is where the challenge that is where the problem comes in so i want us to understand that Every temptation, therefore, is an opportunity to do good because we don't have to disobey. We can be tempted, which by itself is not a sin. And I want us to understand things are going to be injected in our minds, into our thoughts. Things are going to pass our way. All kind of scenarios will present themselves. You're, for those young men that, you, you know, you're at the age now where you're troubled and you're perplexed and you're, you're moved, you know, because you're going through a particular point in your life, you're going to find that Satan somehow in his strategy 
orchestrate situations that will cause young ladies to come your way. Young ladies, you are going through a particular point in your life now where you are open to men in terms of their whistling and their calling to you and such and such. I'm just talking generally. You need to understand that Satan is going to be pushing things at you and he's going to do it at work he's going to do it at school he's going to do it wherever he knows you are and wherever things and scenarios are going to be that will cause you to look and to wonder he is going to put temptation to you but understand that temptation coming in and of itself is not a sin and we 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 can attest to that all of us will be tempted, but we don't have to yield to temptation. And that's why we start off by saying temptation is an opportunity to do good. Because if we don't yield to temptation and we overcome that particular hurdle and overcome that particular temptation that came our way, there is something that happens on the inside. We get this feeling of high. We get this feeling of, oh, under God, I can do this thing. And those of us who went over and came about and came over and went through some temptation and did not yield, did not give in, we find the joy that comes with that. And so it is really and truly an opportunity to do good. Temptation literally provides us with a choice, yes? We can choose to not go that way or we can allow ourselves and our fleshy desires to step in and to say go and many times that happen and so temptation is a weapon that satan used to destroy you or it is a tool of god to develop you and when we say a tool of god remember now we started off by saying god himself is not going to tempt you but he knows that satan is out there to tempt you to trip you up but even with the temptation god could stop the temptation but notice that he does not and as we go on, you're going to realize that even Jesus was tempted. If Jesus was tempted, beloved, I want us to understand that we too will be tempted. But God allows it to happen and then use this as a tool to develop you and I. And I want us to bear that in mind. So that every time that we choose to do good after being tempted, yes, we grow in the character of Jesus Christ. And that is something that I want us to know. There is that feeling, there is that sensation. We can talk about it, we can attest to it. When temptation comes our way and we trust God and we navigate the temptations and we come over, uh, there is this feeling of triumph and it brings this thing on the inside and the more that that happens the more beloved we grow in the character of our lord jesus christ so, so as we look at the next slide what we will see is that at what the question is what is the character of christ like we see this jumping out in galatians chapter 5 and we'll read it quickly galatians chapter 5 verses 22 and 23 so if we talk about as we overcome temptation we grow in the character of Christ we become more Christ-like but the fruit of the Spirit Galatians 5 22 is love joy peace long-suffering gentleness goodness faith at verse 23 meekness temperance against such there is no law so what we find that as we deal with temptation and as we overcome and as we find that we triumph over these things under god we find that we become more and more like him this this fruit of the spirit start to bear in our lives and that is something significant i charge and i challenge the saints of god temptations are going to be coming and we're going to look at the strategies to overcome them in a little while but i want you to know that dare you to confront the temptations that come and you overcome dare to overcome dare to overcome the one that come uh, to push against the flesh and to push against all the things that you want to stand up for dare satan to come with these temptations and dare you to overcome them and to stride over them you become stronger as a christian and you actually take on a more christ-like character and that presents itself with the fruit of the spirit that you bear the man that continues to overcome is going to see that he bears the fruit of the spirit and we just looked at what those 
uh, that fruit is. Of course, there are a couple of them, and we saw them, and I, I, I challenge us. So let's continue with the slide with, as, as we continue to appreciate that temptation will come, but we do not have to succumb to it. We decide that we are going to trust God. We decide that we are going to fight back. We decide that we are going to overcome. We draw closer to God, the Christ-like nature, the Christ-like character is formed in us more and more. And that is very significant. Uh, many times we say, just to be like Jesus, I only want, and this is the song that you know we sing ever so often, oh, to be like him. All through my journey from earth to glory, I only want to be like him. Well, if you want to be like him, if you want his character to be formed in you more and more, and you are a Galatians 5, 22 to 23 Christian, you, we have got to understand that when temptation comes, we must overcome. It is not all right to always be to succumb and fall in and yielding to temptation. It is not all right. It is not normal. We will yield. We will falter. We will fall. But we must not make it a practice. And we are going to come to it and we are going to see it. I want us to know that we can overcome the temptations and we must strive to overcome the temptation. We must not be passive, but we must be active. We must be upfront and we must deal with things as true children of God. Now I want us to understand, beloved, that Satan, he, he tempts us, he's the one, he's the author of temptation because he wants us to fall, he wants us to fail, he wants us to falter, he wants us to miss the rapture, he wants to, because he too is doing his uh, pulling and he's doing his harvesting and he's harvesting from even within the church. Can I tell you, beloved, that Satan is not only pushing at people in the world, he is trying to harvest. He is trying to build his kingdom from those that are in the church right now. And that's the reason why you are being tempted. Because this is his attempt to pull you out of church. Because he knows that once you yield over and over and over again, it's going to weaken you. He knows. He knows that once you're constantly yielding to temptation and falling into sin and disobeying God, even if you're in the church physically, he knows that you're just there. It's just a body. It is just a shell. He knows. And so he's constantly, because he is not satisfied with those who he already has out there. He's looking for more. He's building his kingdom. He's harvesting souls for his kingdom in the same way that we do it for the kingdom of God. And I want us to understand that. But while he does that, we need to know, and I want to show us now, that we don't have to yield. We don't have to just lift our hands and say, here am I, let me just yield to temptation. Forget that. That ought not to happen. That is unnecessary. That we don't need to do that. We can be strong. We have the capacity and the potential. And we only need to know some things. And that's why we're having, we are having a, a study like this. Because we want to open it up. We want us to know. We want us to know the wires of the devil. And the, the Bible tells us that we must not be fooled. Because we know that him only have a set strategy. We know that he only goes in a particular direction. He only follows a certain. And if you look from what happened um, in Genesis, and if you look at what happened with Jesus in, in, in the book of Matthew, when he was led to be tempted of the devil, you're going to find that it is the same approach that was used in Genesis. It's the same approach that was used in Matthew. It's the same approach that is being used today. What is the strategy of Satan? How is it that he tempts us and causes people to falter and fail so very often? Is it that he, what new thing has he devised that has tricked us so much? Well, I am here to tell you tonight that he has come up with nothing new, no new devices. It is the same old story. It is the same old strategy. And the thing is, because we are unaware, because we do not know what his strategies are, we are left up to somehow fight the thing off. How good soldiers operate is that they study and appreciate and know the strategies of 
the adversary. This is what you call getting information, getting intelligence, getting information that will give you the upper hand. Beloved, we have some information that will give us the upper hand in this war against Satan to deal with the temptations that he consistently throws at us. So there are no real, no, really no new strategies. What he has is coming from way back, and they are known, they are predictable. And if we can predict it, then we can position ourselves to safeguard ourselves from falling as a result of temptation. Second Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11 tells us something very significant, and it's the point that I'm making. L lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. We, we look at the same scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, from the New Living Translation. It kind of puts it in a different, a, a kind of more easier to understand English term. It says, so that Satan will not outsmart you, for we are very familiar with his evil schemes. So the things that he schemes and that he plans to use to tempt us, Paul is saying to the Corinthians, we are familiar with those devices. We are familiar with his schemes. We are familiar with his strategies. How is it then that so many of God's children today are unfamiliar? We do not know. And we are just being tempted. And not only being tempted, but we are yielding to temptation to the extent that we are wanting to lift our hands and say, Lord, I give up because I keep faltering, I keep dropping, I keep just being unable. I'm just unable to overcome. Why is that so? And we are going to take our time and, and go through that. But I want to present to us tonight, submit to us tonight, that temptation always follow a four-step process. Simple, but it is what it is. Satan used this four-step process um, on Adam and Eve back in the Garden of Eden. Satan used a similar approach I mentioned it a short while ago on Jesus Christ after he was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. When he was through, you know what happened? He was led right into the wilderness because there he was going to be tempted of the devil. And when we start to see the temptation, we realize that it's in terms of the practice and the process and how it was done. It was the same way that Adam and Eve, talk Eve, was tempted by the devil thousands of years before Jesus Christ. The same process. And it's a basic four-step process. And beloved, I present them to you right now. And the first step of the process is Desire. Desire. And this can be something sinful, or it can even be something that is legitimate. I want us to understand that temptation begins when Satan suggests that I'm put into our minds something that is evil, something that is wicked. He places it into our heart. And then we start to think of it. Let me tell us how desire is built up. When something hits our mind, because deep within inside of us, nothing good is there, as we know. The book of St. Mark, chapter 7, verses 20 to 23, tells us something. And we are going to look at it. But I want us to know that desire comes from within. And inside of us is really nothing good. And so we must understand that we have no confidence in this flesh. Of course, God has washed us and God has cleansed us. But there is something that we must always know. We have a spiritual man and we have a natural man. And the spiritual man and the natural man is always in conflict 
They're fighting against each other. I want us to understand that. And so inside of this natural man are some things that we have to keep under subjection every single day because if we don't we are going to find that the natural man dominate the spirit man and we then have a problem so we must understand i don't want to get into that yet because we are coming down to it but there is a struggle between the natural man and the spiritual man and we determine which one of them have the upper hand but satan starts out with something that is called desire he said, isn't that thing good? Isn't that thing good to the eyes? Did God say that you shouldn't? And he starts to create a desire. Oh, I want, I must have it. I want it. I need it. And if it is something that is wicked and evil, he presents it in a way that we are still going to desire it. And sometimes the thing that we desire can even be something good, as I said. But guess what? Even a legitimate desire can be pursued in a wrong way. And so if the desire is legitimate, what Satan does is establish a way that is illegal or unethical, unlawful, so that although the thing might be good, we might get caught because we were trying to get it in a wrong way. So this is what we have to be very careful of now. St. Mark, sorry, chapter 7, verses 20 to 23. We'll just read some of it. Let us see how far we go. We go, sorry. But it basically indicates to us, and this is why we must be careful of desire. That which cometh out of the man, it is that that defiles the man. It is not the things that go into him, it's that which is coming out, that is that which is inside of the man. That which comes from within, that is what defiles him. That is what verse 20 says. Verse 21 says, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murders, and, and, and thefts, and covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all of these things come from within, and it is that which defiles a man. So that when the desire is presented to you, and you, he, he, he sets before your eyes, practically now, a beautiful young lady for the men, or a attracting young man for the ladies, and you are unmarried, and he presents to you this beautiful lady or this handsome trapping man, a desire is formed. And because deep inside of us, that is coming from within, we have this thing that is latched onto the flesh to want to fornicate and to want to commit adultery and to want to have this and to want to have that and to this desire becomes burning and then we are tempted to want to fulfill the desire and he did that to Eve and this is how the desire that was starting to build up and becomes pent up and becomes burning and becomes, I must have it. I must have him. I must have her. Because we see the thing, it is presented to us, and this is what we see and what is already inside of us get together and creates a desire. And once that desire is there and we allow it to lodge in our minds, in our heart, and we allow it, allow it to sit down, it is just a matter of time before we move from desire to it, we're coming to the next one. It moves from desire to it somehow burning to the point where we have to satisfy the desire. So, beloved, be very careful now. Point number one, there is going to be a desire. 
and you are going to want to have the thing because you see it and you it, it comes into your mind, it is in your heart, it formulates itself, it now mixes with what is already inside of this flesh, which is fornication and adultery and all the passions that is wrapped up in the flesh. And so we just want to have it and it reach its peak. Desire is number one. The second thing that Satan does when he's tempting us is to plant seeds of doubt in your mind, to doubt the word of God, to doubt the things that you know are true. He literally pushes and presses and sows the seed of doubt in our mind. So he tries you to doubt God's word. Is it really a sin? You know, things that once you would have taken for sin and wrong, things that once you would shy away from, all of a sudden you start to get some theology and some teaching from here or there, and all of a sudden what was against your very conscience, you are now embracing, you are now holding it in your lap and saying, it's it not really a sin. You know, and, and, and the, the next thing, does this really apply to us today? We are asking these questions because seeds of doubt have been sown into our hearts. And things that were sacrosanct and things that we would stay away from, all of a sudden we want to do these things and start to question God. That's exactly what happened in the Garden of Eden. Did God say, did God say you're not going to, did God... And then all of a sudden, no, it is not really so, you know. You shall be like gods, and you shall know good, and you shall know this, and you shall know the difference between good and evil. And all that Satan is doing when he plants doubt is to cause you to doubt the word of God so that you can be open to accept what he is saying and yield and succumb to temptation. And that is why we are here today in the 21st century, because he used the strategy of desire and then doubt. He used it in the Garden of Eden, and it was successful. Doesn't God want me to be happy? I'm sure God wants me to know the difference between good and evil so that I can choose good. And then we start to convince ourselves that we're going to go the good path, not knowing that the seeds of doubt is causing us to doubt his word. And once we start to desire evil things, once we start to doubt his word, then the flesh is now starting to have an upper hand. And when the flesh has the upper hand, fornication and adultery and, and lasciviousness and covetousness, and all the things that we just read about become rampant in our little life. And we move and yield to the temptation. I want us to be aware. Watch the desire and the things that you seek after. Watch the desire and the things that you want that you know are opposed to the things of God and the word of God. Watch it. Watch how he sows seeds of doubt for you to doubt the word of God, for you to doubt the veracity of the scripture, for you to doubt if this thing is applicable to us today because we have the tendency today of saying, oh, but that is not for the church today. Nothing is for the church today if you follow the seeds of doubt that are being planted in the minds and hearts of so many people. And so that's why you look around now and you see churches that embrace and accept everything and say so the churches are free for all. Because doubt was planted in the minds of so many as it relates to the word of God. Be very careful. Then the next one, point three, point C. He deceives us. So he uses desire, he sows seeds of doubt, and then he introduces deception. I want us to understand that Satan is incapable of speaking the truth. He speaks things that are either untrue, or he might even come part with and tell you half of the truth. He, 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 he replaces what God says in his word, and through deception, try to tell you that, listen, it's not really so. 
And if you hold on to it and say it's so, then he's going to now come with something else because this is what deception is. Fake. Nobody's going to know. I mean, it's just the both of you. You are in the country. No, in fact, it's not like anybody is going to identify you. Nobody's here. So he got you into a space and it's just the two of you. And he deceives you by telling you that no one will know. And in any case, everybody is doing it. And it's, it's only a little sin. And you want to have a child? Go have the child and, and come back to God. Because he's just and he's faithful. And he will forgive you. And where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. And he uses the scriptures to tell you that nothing is wrong with it. Go do it, man. Just step out for a month and go through with the person and, and when you conceive you're going to have a lovely child and you can have that child to serve God and he gives you all the things and then you have the child you come back and you serve God deception it, 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 it is a deal that if you do this this is going to happen and that is going to happen yes it is unethical and it is illegal but this is the way how business is done in Jamaica and he convinces you and you do it not realizing that you are being deceived brethren it is deception he presents it as a simple thing as a small sin everybody is doing it nobody going no 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 if you whatever you do in the dark is going to be exposed in the bright light and see it and deceive I can tell you of so many men of God so many women of God who once rule and 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 and, and preach this word and rule in the kingdom of darkness and kept Satan under subjection because of their walk with God and I can tell you of men and women of God who were on top of the world and doing the will of God and knew what had to be done and we are day to day because they were deceived into thinking that no one will know they engage in some things that they should not have engaged in and what they thought was secret the proverb said be careful what you whisper about the king because a bird on the wall will fly with it a, f a bird will fly away with it. It was meaning sometimes we think as long as we alone know, you will be surprised that others find out. And God has a way of causing things to just take wings and fly. And before you know it, what you think was between you and one person alone, others know. And this is what happens. See it and deceive you into thinking that no one will know. Or everybody is doing it so you can do it too. Or it is only a little sin and so nothing is wrong with it. Or that God just do it and God will forgive you and you are presumptuous and you do it. And only to find that in the midst of it, you died. Your soul is gone. And Satan is in the background laughing and laughing and laughing. The four ways desire he works upon your desire doubts he plants seed of doubts deception he will deceive you every step of the way and finally that that other one that fourth one it all of these then lead to disobedience and that we must be very 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 careful of and James chapter 1 verse 14 to 15 we won't go into it now because we just want to run through when we finally act on the thought that we have been harboring in our minds then we realize that we go ahead that is when Eve did what God told her not to do some people say she eat the apple some people say she eat the forbidden fruit whatever it was whatever that thing was she did what God told her not to do because Satan placed the desire inside of her and caused seeds of doubt to be planted in her minds and then he deceived her and that then led to disobedience. And this is the way, beloved brethren, how it plays itself out every time. It 
always begins, however, with something that he tempts us with. And when he tempts us, he's going to tempt us with something that we can see or we can hear, or we can touch. Yes? Because these are the things that feeds into our consciousness and our subconsciousness. I want us to understand that Satan, whatever he does, is feeding into our inner man. He wants it to lodge in our minds and this is what happens. You see, when we think about something, when we think about that, that young man or we think about that young lady or we think about getting that illicit car or we think about getting that drug money or we think about you know whatever the thing is that he pushes into our mind he's going to push it there and he's going to keep ramming it because he wants you to harbor it because you see when you start to think of it all of a sudden you say but you know that girl look nice for you you know boy you know that guy because once it is in the mind and we allow it to stay there for a while that is where trouble begins. We must be very careful. We must be very keen. We must be very conscious, beloved, because the desire and then the doubt and then the reception, it is going to lead to disobedience. And God said, man and woman must come together unless they're married. We're going to disobey it and we're going to get together because the flesh has come into the picture because of deception and doubt of, to God's word. And we allow the desire. And once this flesh starts to act up, it is going to put the spiritual man below. It's going to have the upper hand. And you're going to find that we now start to gravitate to the thing that is pleasing to this man this flesh and we will yield to temptation so if this is the strategy of satan then beloved it is important for us to understand that we must having known this strategy we must move with dispatch to safeguard ourselves so if a desire is going to have to first be built and it is going to start from what we see or what we hear or what we feel then it is important that we try to regulate the things that we see that will come into our minds the things that we hear or we constantly listen to so be careful now, the things that we constantly focus our eyes and our attention on, the things that we constantly focus our ears to listen, we must be very careful because the door into our sanctum, our mind, our heart, the door is through the eyes, the ears, the nose. The touch, the hands, be very careful. We can take custody of the entryways into our inner sanctum. Because if we can control the door and guard these things, then we will not allow any and anything to just come into our minds and sit down there. Sometimes as the enemy injects it, you know, it going come. But same way it come, we can push it out. But there is a problem when we choose. And remember, we talked about when we started, we said there is something about temptation. We can choose to either do some things to move away from the temptation, or we can choose to look at the temptation and give it the time of day by thinking about it and causing that thought to sit down for a little while inside of our minds. Sometimes it's nice, it feels nice. Boy, I think about her and in my mind, it is just so pleasing and she's just so pleasant and she's just so nice. And we start to think about how her hair and how her eyes and how all the parts of her and we think about him and how him handsome and how him high blue or brown or black and we start to think about it. And this is where the problem lies. We give it space and that is how desire builds up. And so we have to understand that we must not give space, don't give the, the time of day 
to get comfortable in our minds, in our hearts. Don't do it. Don't do it. And so we're going to come now to just going through quickly some of the strategies so that now that we understand that temptation is coming because Satan wants to trip us up. Know that we understand that there's a four-prong process that Satan used to get to us the desire and the seeds of doubt and deceive us into thinking that all is well. And then all of that come together now, we disobey. It means we would have yielded to the temptation. That is how he works every time. So quickly now, we want to um, move over to see temptation manifesting itself in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. Understand this. Go back to the slide before. Understand this. I just want to make this point quickly before we move over. Hebrews 4, make that point. I won't read it, ring up the scriptures now. Read it later on or tomorrow. But understand, with every temptation that comes, there is always a way of escape. I want us to understand that. And we are going to see that happening even in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you're going to find that when Jesus went into the wilderness to be tempted, he was establishing a principle so that we can know how to escape temptations when they come. And you're going to see what some of the temptations that Jesus went through. So many of us don't understand what happened there, you know. We just think it's a little thing happened and he said, it is written. And you know, sometimes when you preach, we can just preach and say, it is written, the word. And you use the word. And of course that is so. But some, and this is why teaching is important now. Because we're going to take time and we're going to look at what those temptations represented. And that is very significant. And we must not take those things for granted. But the point I'm making here at, as we move over into that. And as we have gone through what we have gone through already, I want to make this point, which comes out in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. One, I, I say it again, and I said it before, temptation is not sin. I want us to understand. It doesn't matter how he bombards us. If he pushes the thing in our mind, um, push it back out. Temptation is not sin. And that is one. Two, there is always Away and God allowed it, God established it that way that there is always a way of escape when temptation comes. I want us to appreciate that and I want us to know that. So none of us are doomed to yield to temptation. No, no, no. Get that out of your mind. We have a way of escape and we can choose the way of escape. And I want us to know. But in order to choose the right way, we have to know how Satan comes and the strategy that he uses and those four things that we just looked at is the process, the same thing that he has done over and over that leads to disobedience. Disobedience being one of the four. Those are the same things strategies, the same tactics that he uses over and over again. So we know that. And we also know, know that there is a way of escape. It don't matter what anybody says, no matter how harsh and rough the temptation, there is a way of escape. Now let us look at the Lord Jesus as he established a pattern for us to follow, right? We know in St. Matthew chapter 4 verse 1, after he had finished his fast. He was afterwards hungry. Yes, and we're looking at the temptation of Jesus. He was afterwards hungry. And being hungry he, and going into the wilderness now, it is time for him. Satan now jump on his case, just as how he's going to jump on all of our cases. Remember, I, remember I told you, beloved, that even after a long fast, and we finish the fast and we decide that we close off now. We're expecting to get on top of the world. Some type of things come our way, you see? It happens so many times and I want us to be aware of these things. This is the principle. This is how Satan works. And we see it happening with Jesus. After 40 days, he's supposed to be on top of the world. And maybe he really was. But look at what happened. Satan jumped on his case right away. And he's going to jump on your case right away understand this it is what temptation is it is how it is it's going to happen while you're fasting when you before you 
start the fast, when you finish the fast. As you finish sometimes, you are going to be bombarded. But the, he established a principle. He established something that we can learn from. It doesn't matter if as you finish, the temptation comes. There is a way of escape. And Jesus was our example. Now understand, the first temptation was that he turned stone to bread. And Jesus responded, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of. All right. Now, turning stone into bread, we, by now we will understand that there was more to what was happening there than we have really taken the time out to examine. There was more. Because the truth is, is it a sin to eat bread after you finish fast? It really is not. Is it a sin to eat when you're through fasting? No. You have to eat. You have to break the fast. So when Satan said, turn the stone into bread, because at that time he was in the wilderness, there was no bread there. So he said, take the stone and turn it into bread and eat it. Nothing is wrong to eat bread, first of all. What is wrong with eating after fasting? I just asked the question. Suppose you have the power to turn stone into bread and you turn it into something to eat to break your fast. What is wrong with that? Nothing. Nothing is wrong with eating bread. Nothing is wrong with eating after your fast. So where is the temptation? When he said, take the stones and make it into bread, turn it into bread, is it only because Satan said so? I mean, that's not going to do it because Satan said Or is there something else that is there for us to learn? Because, as I said, Say we list them there. There's nothing wrong with the things that Satan said that he was supposed to do. Where is the temptation? So we're looking at the, the slide. We continue on our slide. All right. The, what happened here as we drill into it? The temptation was a temptation for Jesus to instantly gratify himself it was a ten temptation of instant gratification you know after 40 days the flesh wants something to eat right away suppose god was saying take time and eat down just have some fruits Late, have a little warm something suppose god was saying later i want you to drink a little soup Suppose it was going to be that, yes, you finished the fast now, but don't just jump and eat. Drink some tea, and it's 40 days, you know, you're on, so you're going to break it in a certain way. Don't just eat food now. After you finish and you pray, you know, so the fast is finished. You know that many times you are tempted to just start eating. In fact, when you drink a tea, you want a little bit more. We just do a five-day, and some people say, when them, after the five days, when they're supposed to drink a small bowl of soup, they say, them drink three bowls. Instant gratification. And you know what can happen when, if you do that? You can hurt yourself. Satan was literally tempting Jesus to gratify the desire of the flesh that wanted food right now. And we have to understand that there is something about this flesh that always wants instant gratification. It wants sensual gratification. It wants, oh, and we're going to be tempted this way. And it's saying, wait until you're married because that is what God requires. Then there is going to be the thing playing in your mind. But I am 25 now. I am 30 now. And my flesh has, is rising up. And I'm going to have to do this. And the flesh is going to say, do it no man. Because you're, you're biologically, this is what and how God made you, and the flesh is going to be tempted to satisfy and to gratify this flesh instantly. Don't wait until you get married, do it now. And there's always going to be a, a, an argument that somehow supports doing it. And somebody said, look here, you really ought to be married, you know, but if you don't have the opportunity to be married because nobody has come, nobody has called you, nobody. So in other words, if you can't get married, get married. But if nobody comes, you can't be married. The biological needs are there. Do what God made you to do. And that is the argument that is there now. Instant gratification, whether it is sexual gratification, whether it is 
just to eat as you feel like. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter if it affects your health wise. Just gratify the flesh. Uh, we have to be very careful of this spirit of just doing it. No. Do it if it pleases me. Do it if it feels right. Do it right now. We have no regard for the timetable of God. We have no regard for the timing of God. We have no regard for they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. We just want the thing and they want the thing to happen now. And it is a sin where we just want to be instantly gratified. And nothing is wrong, was wrong when if Jesus was to turn stone into bread. Nothing was wrong if Jesus was to eat because he had finished fasting. But he was not going to follow what Satan said to instantly gratify his flesh because there might have been something he knows that would have required him to wait a while before he eats, before he starts to satisfy the flesh. Wait a while. Do it in this particular way. Do it in the way that God will show. But the flesh would have been crying out after 40 days. And Satan is now tempting him. Do it now. Turn this into bread now. And do it. Be careful. The temptation of turning stones into bread was the temptation of instant gratification. Be careful how we want to satisfy this flesh Every time that it cries out, one way or the other, be very careful. Learn from the scriptures. All right, next slide tells us. The second temptation of Jesus Christ. Cast yourself down. St. Matthew chapter 4, 5 to 7 gives us. No. I want us to understand that this temptation, and I want us to also know that Satan was actually quoting from the scripture. So you, did you know that Satan will use the scripture to tempt you? Be brethren, beloved, do, do you know that Satan knows the scripture? He will use the scripture at you, so you have to know the scripture. No, he said to Jesus, cast yourself down and didn't the Lord, the Bible say that he will send his angels to hold you up, that you don't dash your feet against the stone? This that he is tempting Jesus with, when he said, cast yourself down. He was coming from that scripture in the Old Testament, which simply was saying that if you stumble, God will help you. Not a situation that if you jump off of a cliff. Because that is two different things. So Satan was saying, jump off the cliff. So he was twisting the scripture. Tempting Jesus. Using the scripture, but twisting it. For the Bible, the scripture that he was using was, as I said, one where God was saying, if you stumble, God will hold you up, man. If you buck your foot, God will stabilize you. He's going to set you up on high. He's going to keep you because I'm holding you. But that is if you stumble, if you buck your foot, if you're totally different from what Satan was now telling him to jump off of this thing and see if God not going to send his angel to keep you up. One, he twisted the scripture. But two, he was now presenting to Jesus. And notice what it said when you go into the scripture. It said, if you are the son of God, do this. Listen, Satan knew who he was. So he was going to go and choose something there. If you are the son of God. He knew that this was the son of God. So, so don't watch that. Two persons that were there knew who Jesus was. Jesus knew who he was. And Satan knew who was there. But he was just using that. Uh, if you are this. Because he was kind of boosting him up. If you say you are the son of God. If you say you are a Christian. If you say you are a preacher. Do that me miss it because him say now going to take care of his own. This is how he tempts you and I. And this is how he's going to come. But guess what he was actually doing now? He was literally daring the grace and protection of God. He was daring Jesus, jump off and make God say what he's saying going to do. You have to be careful, beloved, that you don't become daring or presumptuous, because that's the word, presumptuous. 
presuming the grace and mercies of God. In other words, let me tell you what this means. Let me tell you what this thing is saying. The deep meaning of the second temptation. We must be careful when he tells him to, to jump off. He was telling him to be presumptuous. So you don't buck your foot. You don't stumble. But you want to see if God and what God will do. So you just go jump off of a cliff. No. You cannot be presumptuous. God will take care of you if, in your time of need. God will take care of you in your time of weakness. God will help to hold you up when you're unaware that the enemy is about to shoot arrows at you and he will block the arrows. You don't even know that they were coming. Do you know how many arrows he would have blocked already? God will do those things. He knows and he will do those things. But I want you to understand, brethren, beloved, it is a different thing when he says to jump off. That is now going into the realm of being presumptuous. And this is the point that I want to us to get coming out of this second temptation. Don't just do something and commit a sin, presuming that God will forgive us of the sin. That is what you call presumptuous sin. Satan was pushing Jesus to jump off of a cliff because God said he would protect you and don't make you dash your foot against a stone. That was presumptuous. God said, if you buck your foot or if you stumble along the way, I'm going to hold you up, safeguard you. That's different from being presumptuous and jumping off a cliff to see and prove and, and try God. That's totally different. That is being presumptuous. And David said in, in the book of Psalms, keep me. I'm going to show it on the next slide. Keep me from presumptuous sin. So what we have to be careful of, what we must grasp from this, and the next, let's just turn to the next slide. slide. What we must grasp from this, well, sorry, go back to the second. I thought another point was there. What we must grasp from this, yes, this is the, what I wanted. What we must grasp from this, the temptation or the second temptation of Jesus Christ is a temptation of presumptuous sin. Psalm 19 and verse 13 says, Keep back thy servant from presumptuous sins. Jumping off of a cliff is a total presumptuous. That would have been, that's not God, what God was talking about. So, how do we link that with our current reality? When men decide that they know that it is wrong, they know the consequence, but they still decide to do it because they know that God will forgive them. And so they do the sin, that, 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 get in, 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 entangled with the thing, get up, bid, come church, and say, God forgive me because I did this. That's presumptuous. That's what David in the Psalms said, keep thy servant from presumptuous sin. We do the thing because we know that God is going to forgive us. Be careful. That was the essence of the second temptation. The temptation of presumptuous sin. And I want to tell you, beloved brethren, presumptuous people never get to be where God wants them to be. And we will be missing out on so much. Be very, very careful. And I, 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 got, I want us to guard ourselves from being presumptuous. That is the essence of the second temptation, the temptation of presumptuous sin. The first one, instant gratification, the sin, the temptation of instant gratification. And the second one is the temptation of presumptuous sin. Be very careful. So we're going drilling into this temptation thing, you know. It is very serious. And we are seeing some things. And so we go to the third temptation of Jesus. So every one of them have a lesson. So sometimes we just talk about the word part. It is written. But there is a lesson in every one of those three temptations. And we saw the first two. This, the third one now in St. Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 to 11. We say, you know, you bow down and worship me. So he was saying to Jesus, just bow down and worship me. Just give him a little acknowledgement. Because he knew that Jesus would not. He knew that Jesus would not. 
just sit down and worship him like that. But he just acknowledge that I am the God of this world or acknowledge that I am able to do this or, or give me some props and, and be very careful. What he was saying to Jesus was, just give me something. Give me a little area. Give me one little aspect. Give me a little prop. Give me a little acknowledgement. And this is very subtle. This is very sinister. Yes? Because Satan does it in a way. Because he knows that you're not going to just say, Hallelujah, Satan. He knows you're not going to do that. He knows Jesus wouldn't do that. And he knows you and I are not going to do that. He knows you're not going to say, Glory to Lucifer. He knows. And he's smart enough not to expect that. But he wants us to give him a little acknowledgement. And, you know, give him a little prop. And give him something. Because he knows that if he can occupy one little area of your heart, if he knows if he can occupy one little space in your mind or have one little chamber anywhere in a corner, that is enough to divide your loyalty where God is concerned. So what he does he doesn't want you to come bow down before him. Because he knows you're not going to do that. We are smart enough in the 21st smart enough in the 21st century to know that we're not going to bow down prostrate before a, a, a figure, a, a big piece of stone carved out into an image. We, he knows that's not going to happen in the 21st century. Give him that. He's smart enough. He knows that. And he knows Jesus would not do that at the time when he said, you know, bow down and worship me. You know, or give me just a little props to acknowledge that I am the God of this world and I have power and might. Because just giving him a little or having a place anywhere there is enough to divide your loyalty. And that is very significant. So I want to make this point now. Yes, therefore, you see, if you find that your career your business, your home, your bank account, your children. If we find that some little things have taken up so much of our time and our money and our energy and our enthusiasm, if we find that all of our enthusiasm and our energy is given to our careers and our business, I submit to you right now, there is a divided loyalty. Yes, there is. The loyalty is, div is divided and we are not fully 100% serving God. Once we give most of our energy and our money and our time and our effort and our enthusiasm to business or home or making money, it means that that particular thing has become more important than God. And this is the part that a lot of saints don't want to accept, but it is true. And we better accept it so that we can free ourselves and learn to put priority where priority is due so we give you look at the time that we spend trying to get our jobs done the right way trying to set up our business so that it is profitable trying to fix up our, fix up our home so it looks the nicest and everything look at the time that we spend trying to make sure so we save this and we work over time so we can put up this and we work around the clock in the business so we can put up that to make sure that our bank balances look nice and look at all the time and look at the energy that we put into all of these things and the effort and and the money that we spend to, for all of these things and then look at what money we give to church or for the things of god look at what money we take to buy a book to read and study and learn more about god we give the lease to god we spend more on food and everything else than we spend to put plant in the kingdom, to buy a book that is spiritual that will enlighten us and lift us. 
We don't do not like that to, 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 to give to somebody so that they can buy a dinner one day or so. We give very little. We don't tithe, we don't give offering, we don't do nothing. And if it's a give an offering, we give $100. But a big executive conference is going to be held at the AC Hotel. And we pay $10,000. And another one is going to be held at the Pegasus that teaches us how to build our business and how to do this. And we pay $20,000. And, 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 and in the offering plate, we throw $100. I am telling you, beloved, the temptation, the third temptation about worship. We know that it was not that Jesus and the Bible is expecting so we're going to bow down and say, oh, heal Satan. No. It has to do, it is a temptation that when we look close at it, it has to do with our loyalty to God and our giving him our all. All our strength, all our mind, all our soul. All. We have not given him what he has asked us for. We have not given him what we have asked us for, what he has asked us for. We have not. None at all. Absolutely not. And so, beloved, the temptation of divided loyalty. Where is your loyalty? Huh? So we are seeing now that all of us will be tempted and we are going to be tempted in terms of our loyalty how much we care about God and the things of God how much we balance between spiritual things and natural material things our business our our, our jobs our home our children our bank accounts all the other things temptation is going to come in those areas temptation is going to come as to, to see how much we want to gratify and satisfy this flesh. Temptation is going to come that will want us to go do something, although we know say it's wrong, but we're going to do it still because when we're done and we do the wrong thing, we just put myself together and we go to God and say, God, here I am, forgive me again. And presumptuous temptations are going to come in these areas. Look out for them. So we have seen these things and we have learned these things and we see that temptation is here to mash us down and to destroy us. But we are also seeing now that we are understanding what is at play. How do we practically, strategically defeat these temptations? And it's about wrapping up time. So I'm going to wrap up with a few, and I'll just go through this part relatively quickly. Better we need to be careful. We need to be, in our minds, be clear. Clear as crystal. Clear as crystal that we don't secretly gloat and, you, you know, quietly we care more for material things more than we care about the things of God. Some people make a lot of noise, and they, but deep down, they must think that I eat that. I have to put on my money, and I have to put on my this, and I have to make sure that my children, of course we want to make sure that your children go to school. Of course we want your children to go to the best school. Of course we want you to put on money and save this, because I don't know how folks sometimes reason that way. And yes, I'm going to do that. Oh, yes, we're going to. And then when you're going to the quiet place, and you're quietly in your little corner, yeah, but they must think, you're being, we can be hypocrites, you know, we have to be very careful because we can be hypocrites and hurting ourselves. What we must be careful of is that we do not have a divided loyalty. God first, everything else come after. As simple as that. We're not asking for any more. We don't want you to give what you don't have. We don't want you to do what you can do. We don't want you to do what God do give you the unction and capability and capacity to do. We don't want that. But we want you to give God your best and to place him at the highest place. Eh? That's what we want. So anything else outside of that, how you treat with all the things that you have, if you give them more energy and time and effort and what you call it, you, you're more focused, then you give to God, 
that thing or those things become idols as straight as that as plain as that all your energy going into the, they are your idols you have a divided loyalty and is either all or nothing where God is concerned and I can safely tell all of us that I can tell me that I can tell you that it is all or nothing so be very careful this thing about temptation is not a little word that just passed by. Oh, temptation will come my way. I can tell my night from day. And, and it's just what we all go through it and we all fall. And one of these days we will get up. We better understand after a while that we keep falling and falling. Or we fall and don't get up back. So we must know what we're up against. Plan for it. See how the devil strategizes. Establish our own strategies and deal with temptation and overcome. So we look now at the strategies as we close. Practical strategies to overcome temptations. One, walk in the spirit. I said earlier on as we were talking, there are two things that are at play. Two things are at, are at play in our lives. We are, we are in a fight. And I'm talking about the war that is taking place inside of our body with the spirit and the flesh. Hmm? The spirit and the flesh. And there is this constant warfare. And if we allow the spirit to have the preeminence, it will dominate and keep the flesh down. However, if we allow the flesh to have the upper hand, it will dominate the spirit man and keep him down. So there is the law of the flesh and there is the law of the spirit. The law of the flesh and the law of the spirit. And make the law of the spirit, make the spirit man keep the flesh man down. Walk in the spirit. How do we do that? We keep a constant prayer life. Yes. Cry out to the Lord. Yes. Regularly. All the time. Don't be intimidated by Satan. Period. You don't have to because... You have what it takes to stand up, to face him, and to overcome. I'm telling you. And remember now, as we walk in the spirit, we will be able to see through spiritual eyes the way of escape that the Lord has made for every temptation that will come to, to us. Walk in the spirit. Once you are discerning things spiritually, you are going to discern and you're going to see a light where otherwise you would have not seen the light to show you the way of escape from that particular temptation. I want us to understand that. Walk in the spirit. Let the spirit man have preeminence. Let it dominate the flesh man. Otherwise, the flesh man will dominate. And once the flesh is in control, your eyes will be blinded. You will never see the way of escape. And you will always be suffering. And you will always be failing. And you will always be yielding to temptation. And ultimately, you will die. We will die. It is very important. Walk in the spirit. Practically, second, change your surroundings. And this is a practical one. Change your surroundings. Genesis, I think we should look at this one. Genesis chapter 39, 11 to 12. You will realize that there was a situation where Potiphar's wife threw herself. It's all right. We just make note of the scripture. We won't have to turn to it because time is upon us. So Potiphar's wife threw herself and at a time when they were alone now because sometimes the environment is conducive to a particular kind of temptation and Satan knows it so they were alone but of course it was not on Joseph's mind and so he was doing what he was doing but it was the right moment the environment was right Satan structured the thing and orchestrated the moment and Joseph wouldn't look at her but because they were alone she grabbed him and said come lie with me and hey listen See, um, Joseph, when the lady held on to him, he physically removed himself from that surrounding, from the location. In fact, the Bible said that he ran. Notice, 
he didn't try to reason with her and said, Mrs. Potiphar, you can't do this to me, man, and you can't do this to yourself. She goes, no, 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 man, no, you can't. Look, Joseph ran. Leave him caught. You don't reason with certain things. You don't sit down in the environment, in the atmosphere, in that particular surrounding, and try to reason your way out of something. We have to understand, beloved, that a, a strategy to overcome temptation is to change your surroundings and run away if it requires that. Run away. Don't walk, you know. Don't take time. Run. Don't reason it out and talk about, no, man, you can't do this to me. You can't do this to yourself. You can't do this because your husband and my friend. Hello, run away. Practical strategies move away. The Bible said he ran. He was practical. He, he ran out of that particular surrounding. He changed the environment. He changed the surrounding. And we have to do that. Sometimes we are in a particular area. And we are going to wrap up in a, another five minutes. We are in a particular area. And we see that this is where our weakness manifests itself. That is where Satan is going to come tempt you. That is when he's going to come in. Get ourselves out and away from that particular situation. And that is the second. Thirdly, recognize your pattern. That should be pattern of temptation. And the scripture is there to give you a little. Now, what does that mean? Each of us has unique areas of weakness. No matter how strong we are, no matter how long we have been saved, we all have some weaknesses, yes? We have our strengths, but we have some weaknesses. And we have to be careful how we protect the weakness, how we protect the underbelly. Remember we spoke recently about the serpent, and Jesus said that we must be wise as serpent. The serpent knew that he has a soft underbelly, you know, so he's always crouched and he's underbelly, protecting that belly. And we want to make sure he can push out and strike you, and he can wrap himself around you and squeeze you. But once he's on the ground, he knows his weakness and his exposure that underbelly he always protects. So we have to be wise and know our weaknesses and therefore know how to be as wise as a serpent and protect our underbelly, our weaknesses. Certain situations makes you more vulnerable to temptation. Then guess what you do? When you recognize that those situations kind of make you feel lightheaded and you feel like you're gone and you now have no control over yourself, then guess what? Stay away from those vulnerable areas, those vulnerable places. Sometimes when you go in a certain environment, you feel like you want to drink. If you was a drunkard before and got saved, did you know that people that are saved for 20, 30 years from um, being a drunkard, even after 30 years, if you're not fully prayed upon, so and you walk past a bar and you smell Smirnoff, or you smell Appleton and Pepsi, you know that that can just catch you and all of a sudden something starts to work and that weakness inside of you get the better of you and after 30 years you take one drink and you're gone again. We need to understand that, recognize your pattern of temptation, know your weakness, stay away from vulnerable areas, practical solution and that will make a big difference. Can't go any further because time is upon us, but you get this, the gist of what I'm saying. And so that is significant that we look at these things. Move on. D, Ecclesiastes, and I want us to read this, this one. I'm going to allow us to read this one quickly. Ecclesiastes 4 and verse 12. So, virgin, speak to a godly brother or sister, somebody that you know is godly, somebody that you are close to. And if one prevail against him, hmm? if somebody, if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold cord is not easily broken. So listen to me now. If you are being overcome, get a virgin or two that you know you can trust and you're confiding. You know, if, if, if there is, if there are virgin around and if one be overtaken with a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one man. Pray one for the other. Confess your faults one to the other and pray one for the other. It is significant. It is important. It is a principle. So two shall withstand him and a threefold cord is not easily broken. So when you have support, 
when you have, whether it's two or three or more, once you have support with a brother or a sister, and I would say, sister, don't just go to a brother. Our brother, don't just go to a sister. Find another brother, brother. Find another sister, sister, because there are sisters that are around that sisters you can go to, and you bind yourself together and pray so that you are strengthened in a particular area where you find yourself weak. Don't waste no time. Don't make another day pass. Do it. It is a practical solution. It is biblical and it works. Next, cut off things that trigger temptation. Romans 13 and verse 14. We're not even going to turn to it. Read it. Watch out for those cell phones. Sometimes you take up the phone and before you know it, you switch on to something. And you know that in that phone, places where we would have to go run a car and go way down and take a bus and go to a shop and buy a video years ago and to play and hide that video and watch it. That blue movie. That dangerous movie. You know, just take up your cell phone and one click, two clicks, and you're into a site. That is a pornographic site. And, if do, and those things will trigger temptation. Cut off those things. And if you find that every time you take up a phone, you, when you make the call, your fingers drift over so that you can tap into that area, dash with the phone. It is better you cut off your right hand than, and go into the kingdom of God. Cut off the parts that are like triggers that cause you to succumb to temptation. The principle is there in scripture. And although these were metaphors that Jesus used, you can't escape the fact that he was saying, it is that serious. And that is the point that I am making. And that is the point that we are bringing across here. Cut off the things that trigger temptation. Practical solutions to defeat temptation. Watch those websites that you go on. Watch those movies that you stay up in the late night and watch on HBO and, and the other ones. Watch out. And finally, seek out counsel and advice. Since we are closing now, we can read this last one, Proverbs 11 and verse 14. Seek out counsel. You have leaders that you can call upon, that can sit and talk with you. You have leaders that we can call upon that can give us advice. Where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. I want us to understand the principle of getting help by talking to people in leadership that God has established. God has established leadership. Don't be afraid. Talk. Present the thing. Don't pretend that all is well and everything is going good when we know it is not. We are in a time that if we allow ourselves to continue to be buffeted and we continue to yield to temptation, it is but a matter of time that we are going to fall. It is only a matter of time that we are going to fall. So I encourage us, Virgin Beloved, as we close to Look at these principles. I won't go back over them because the time is upon us. But they are all there in the presentation on the slides. Look at them. Write them down. Review them. Yes, review them. And take your own time and make sure that you understand how serious temptation is. The prophet in that Old Testament scripture in 1 Kings 13 gives a stark warning to how we can die, to how things can turn when it comes to God and our yielding to temptation and disobeying the things that we know to be true and to be right and to be correct. Be very careful how we treat with God. Be very careful how we are presumptuous and yield to temptation with the understanding in our minds that I'll just go to God and ask for forgiveness tomorrow. So what? Be very careful. These were the things that we saw coming out in the temptation of Jesus. And we saw all the things coming down the line. Temptation is a 
dangerous thing. It is an act of war against the children of God. See it for what it is and brace ourselves. See the strategies of the devil because he has them and he uses the same type, however. But we can establish and put our strategies together. And we have looked at a couple of them from A to F. And just simple they are, simple as they are, they are profound, they are deep, they are powerful. And just apply them and make sure that we fight and stand against temptation. They will come, but we do not have to yield. I stop here tonight, but the time is up on us. God bless you. We pick up next week, same time, as we take on another set of nuggets that will help us as children of God to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and that we will be stronger Christians and that we will be ready for his return. God bless you as we put together strategies to the feet are to overcome temptations. God bless you. Let us pray. We bless your great name, mighty God, and we thank you for another time to share and to teach in Bible study. I pray, Father, that you will help us to put these things together, take it from top to bottom so that we understand how Satan strategizes to tempt us and to cause us to yield. I pray that you will help us, mighty God, to look to heaven, to feel after and to depend on the Spirit of God and to stand strong so that we will find a way of escape that you have prepared for every temptation so that we can be victors and ultimately stand before the presence of our God and our King. Thank you for tonight. Thank you for your people. Bless their hearts with this word and let it find a place so that all of us can learn and grow from the words that have just been spoken. Have your own way. Let your perfect will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God wish to bless you. I believe it is is it this coming Sunday or is it next Sunday, the 20th? I don't remember what date it is, but that thing with the bun make sure that you're, and cheese, make sure that your orders are in and you touch base with the folks at the office. Do not let this period pass and your orders are not in, whether you eat them or not. We'll give them to some needy folks, but we want us to do it as a support to our building program. The Lord bless you. Thank you for tuning in. And God's willing, next week, same time, we continue with Bible study in the name of the Lord. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.